Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. It's 10.30. I see that we have around 50 participants. We're still waiting for some more, so let's give them uh, 30 seconds or one minute before we, before we get started. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I have muted all of the participants. Um, just so we don't have any background noise, you can unmute yourself, but I would generally suggest that we take questions at the end of the webinar. Uh, so please remain um, on mute mode. Thank you. Now, 10.31, I suggest we get started uh, as we have quite a schedule today. Uh, and then the participants who will join us uh, during the meeting, hopefully they won't miss too much. So to begin with, uh, I will briefly go through the agenda with you. Uh, we will make a short introduction. Then we will speak about the obligations of a Swiss financial institution uh, we will speak about the new CRS guidance, uh, not all of the news, but those that are particularly relevant for the fiduciary industry. We will talk about inquiries from the Swiss Tax Administration, CRS audits uh, by the Federal Tax Administration, a little bit of an outlook for the future. Where do we go from here? We will end with a Q&A session. Uh, and at the end, you also have our contact details and some, some useful links. To start with, uh, I might also introduce myself, Emily Mahler. Um, I'm the head of Kender's regulatory team. So we deal, among other matters, with FATCA CRS. We, of course, have a strong focus on Switzerland, although we cover other jurisdictions. Uh, and by popular request after our last webinar, we saw that there's a big interest for a Switzerland special. So now we are, um, we're hosting one uh, and hope you will find it useful. With me today, I also have Christian Lick, who is our CEO uh, and very directly and heavily involved with the whole regulatory environment of FATCA CRS. He's also our FATCA responsible officer. And Christian uh, may break in whenever he feels like he has something to add. Uh, and then, of course, um, at the outlook at the end and at the Q&A, Christian and I will uh, will share um, this part, but otherwise you will mostly have to listen to me today. So I will try not to make you fall asleep. So here we go. What is the status quo now? Four years in and three reporting portals in uh, for CRS in Switzerland. So CRS in Switzerland is nothing new. This is why we will not go into the basics basics, but we will really focus on the more current uh, issues or concerns for Swiss uh, financial institutions, most importantly. Uh, and when I say four years and three reporting portals in, yes, um, most of you that were uh, a part of CRS setup from the, from the onset have seen three different reporting portals. Uh, this year we got to keep the one from last year, so that's a big plus. Um, I think we have learned a lot in these um, past few years. There have been more clarifications from, from the authorities, a couple of uh, guidance updates, etc. So uh, I think we're in a much better position now than we were four years ago. On the current agenda, um, these are the topics that we will cover today, like the the updated guidance uh, and now we also start to see the results of CRS uh, exchange of information. So for example uh, clients of us or even colleagues of us, we will uh, come to this topic later, have for example received requests from the tax authorities with regard to the reporting. Uh, so here we see that uh, the information that is being exchanged is not only just stored <laughs> in a big black box, but authorities are actually looking at them uh, and asking questions. And where there are any sort of gaps in the setup, they, the, the authorities are now covering them up. So this is what we're seeing now with the new guidance and the 
audits, etc. And then we will try to look into our crystal ball and see uh, how we think that things will proceed in the future. And again, uh, I do ask you to remain on mute uh, mode because then we don't have any background noise. And then since we have quite a lot of participants, I think we have over 100 sign up for today. Please take note of your questions and save them until the Q&A session at the end uh, or write them in the chat and then I will address them during the Q&A. Thank you. Let's start. So first we wanted to just give you uh, a brief um, let's say, brush up on the obligations of a Swiss financial institution. We will not stay on this part for very long because it's nothing new in that sense, but just so that we have covered these most important aspects. The key components uh, of the obligation of a Swiss FI, financial institution, um, is the registration obligation, due diligence obligation, information obligation, and reporting obligation. We'll quickly go through these topics. So a Swiss FI must register with the FTA, the Federal Tax Administration, uh, without being requested to do so and no later than uh, at the end of the year, in the year in which the entity became a financial institution. So this means that if we establish a Swiss company today uh, and it classifies as an FI, it would need to register with the FTA soon as possible, but at least before year end. Um, for the fiduciary industry, the trust industry, of course, the TDT, trustee documented um, trust concept is relevant. Now, a trustee documented trust is technically a non-reporting FI, but the trustee instead has the reporting obligation. So a TDT trust would need to be registered just like a normal reporting FI. Uh, and the difference is that you add the TDT prefix before. So TDT equals before the name. TDT equals the XYZ trust. Same applies here. This is the simple one, but please don't forget to register your FI on time. Then, um, also, when it comes to deregistration, because of course the classification as an FI may be changed uh, for some reason, or an entity is terminated, liquidated, or it is being transferred to a new service provider uh, and you are no longer responsible for the reporting, then you also need to apply for deregistration without delay. So, this means that if an entity ceases to be an FI today without delay, you should contact the FTA. Uh, request the deed registration in written. Um, nowadays, you can send an email to them. You need to have the documentation ready, for example, in order to, to explain why uh, you want to deregister an FI uh, and be ready to answer any questions if they have follow-up questions, because the FTA do uh, scrutinize these cases and check that it's really, um, that it should really be deregistered. Um, then, of course, um, the entity also have to have fulfilled all of its reporting obligations before it can be deregistered. So this means that if an entity is being um, liquidated today, it will still have a reporting obligation next year and only after this it can be deregistered. Uh, and this is important to, to take note of. Then, of course, if an entity continues to be an FI, uh, but somebody else will take over the responsibility for the reporting, then you can transfer the use rights at the portal. Uh, and then you just need to get the details from the new service provider. Uh, and then you can send them an invitation code. They can um, activate this invitation code. And in this sense, you just transfer the user rights. So then you wouldn't deregister, but transfer. And this you can technically do without the involvement of the authorities. That's that on the registration obligation. And well, I might mention as an end on the registration obligation that um, also the registration needs to be done timely. So um, sometimes we have seen in history, maybe people forget to deregister. Uh, so please keep check on that, make an annual check. Do, we, do all of the registered entities remain registered or 
do we for some reason have to deregister an entity and then take care of it? Then, of course, the due diligence obligation. This is a big topic and we will not go into detail, um, but there are different due diligence obligation. Depends on whether it's an individual account holder or an equi um, entity account holder, uh, and also at least to part if it's an existing or a new account holder. Uh, and let's say now a couple of years in, uh, it's might be more relevant to look at the new account holders. Many firms, Kendris included, have also um, basically decided to treat all accounts as new accounts, which means um, a higher scrutiny uh, and essentially collection of self-certification from all account holders. This is an approach we would generally advise, um, advise firms to go in. Uh, and in connection to these due diligence um, of new accounts, um, the Swiss FI will have to obtain self-certification, review it for correctness and appropriateness, uh, and the FI can rely on the information given, assuming it does not know or have reason to believe that the information is not correct. So this, for example, means that if you receive a self-certification from a client who certifies to be tax resident um, in a jurisdiction, and you have good reason to believe that this is not correct, then it's time to, to uh, ask further questions. So this means that um, if the information certified is in line with all of the other information you do have from your AML KYC documentation, or in our line of business, we know most of our clients, uh, and we can assess, um, the, let's say, the reasonableness quite good uh, and always make sure to ask questions if it is for some reason not reasonable. We have uh, just to illustrate um, prepared a couple of decision trees based on the Swiss guidance. Um, we will share this presentation with you after the webinar uh, so you can have a closer look at it uh, but just to quickly go through. So if we um, talk about due diligence for new uh, individual accounts you start with collecting a self-certification. First, you check, is it valid? For example, is it signed and dated? And is all information that you request in? Yes. Then you can move uh, to the next step to check if, it's, uh, if the information is plausible or correct based on what you know uh, or what you have reason to believe. If not, of course, you have to go back to the first step uh, and start again with collecting a self-certification. Now, uh, if the person is resident in a participating jurisdiction, it will be a reported, uh, a reported person. And if it is not, let's say it's, for example, the person is resident in the US, then it's not a reportable person for CRS purposes, at least until circumstances change. Uh, and this is also something that is important to, to monitor uh, over the course of the business relationship that any change of cir um, circumstances needs to be reported to you. So the client has basically when they signed the self-certification form also said that if something changed, I will let you know. Then of course we know that this is not always the case. Um, and then if the client during a meeting, for example, tells you that, yeah, you know, we're planning to move into Spain, then you know, aha, okay. So I will have to ask my client to make sure that he or she provides me with a self-certification uh, if the tax residency changes. Similar, uh, if we talk about new entity for a new entity account holders, um, first step, can it be based on publicly available information uh, established that the entity is not a reportable person? Let's say you have received a a loan from Credit Suisse or UBS, then you know that it's an FI and you don't have to collect a self-certification. But otherwise, most of the time, you do go to the step of collecting a self-certification. Again, you check if it's valid, if it's reasonable. If not, go back to the <laughs> collection part again. Uh, you want to check if the entity is resident in a participating jurisdiction. If yes, it's a reportable account holder. If no, at this point, not a reportable account holder. Then, of course, for entities, you also need to know its status. Uh, so this will be decisive. So, for example, if it's an FI, even if it's resident uh, in a participating jurisdiction, 
it's not a reportable account holder uh, because it has own reporting obligation. But if it's an active NFE, it is reportable. Uh, and if it's a passive NFE, it is reportable. And you also need to collect documentation on its controlling persons since you're looking through and also potentially reporting the controlling persons. This will be on the next step. So if you know that the account holder is a passive NFE, and irrespective of the passive NFE is reportable or not, maybe, for example, a Swiss financial institution has a Swiss passive NFE account holder. So this Swiss passive NFE account holder will not be reportable because it's Switzerland, Switzerland, domestic situation. Um, but its controlling person maybe live in Germany or France, uh, and then they would still be reported. So then you need to collect self-certifications from the controlling person or persons can be several. Um, again, check if it's valid, uh, if it's plausible. Uh, are these persons or this person resident in a participating jurisdiction? If no, not reported. If yes, they are being reported. So this is the kind of, uh, let's say, the, the simple explanation of, of the due diligence requirements. And I think you all have this under control, so <laughs> won't bore you for too long. Then the next part of uh, these four main obligations of a Swiss FI is the information obligation. This means that the Swiss reporting FI has an obligation to inform its account holders um, that it is a Swiss reporting FI, that it will be reporting, for, uh, will be reporting information, uh, also which type of information, so name, address, TIN, account balance, payments, etc. Um, you need to provide a list of Switzerland's partner states so that the account holder sees um, the whole exchange network uh, and also inform how the information is being treated under uh, data protection rules and the EEO Act. Uh, and this information needs to be provided to the account holders by the 31st of January in the first year when they become reportable. Uh, but this is otherwise a one-off, uh, so you don't need to inform them again every year. Now, many firms uh, have as a practice to always each year uh, inform the account holders about what is going to be reported in detail. Um, and this, I think, is a nice or we think is a nice client service. Uh, and it gives also the reported person the um, the possibility to ask questions or even if something is not correct to react on it before it's reported so that you can address these issues. Um, but this is not a legal obligation as such, but rather as a value added, let's say, or client service. Then, of course, almost the most important thing, uh, the reporting obligation. As well as FI, of course, have to report its account holders uh, and or controlling persons of account holders. Um, this uh, you can only do electronically, so not on paper. Either you can do it via an XML upload uh, or manually. Uh, and whether you choose to do it via XML upload or manual upload, most of the time depends on, let's say, the volume of accounts. So. If we have a small family office with four FIs, uh, it might be quicker and cheaper to just um, report manually. Whereas if you have a bigger population or a larger amount of accounts to be reported, um, it will be more efficient uh, and let's say more, more secure, uh, less prone to error to actually make use of the XML upload. The reporting, as you know, is due by the 30th of June. And so I think all of you or most of you have now just recently finalized all of your reports uh, last week. This is also why we thought it might be a good timing to do this webinar now in the beginning of July. So you have um, done, you're done with all of the reporting and you're almost ready to go on vacation. Uh, and now, oh, sorry, mute so we don't have background noise. Um, now it's the time to just wrap it up and maybe see what do you need to prepare for next year? Is everything on track? Do you need to think about CRS just a little bit more before you go on vacation? Then if a Swiss FI has no reportable accounts, um, it also is required to file a so-called nil return. 
this is a little bit unclearly um, stated in the guidance and in the legislation, but basically um, the FI is obliged to inform the FTA accordingly if it has no reportable accounts, and this basically means nil return. And this is also simple to do manually over the report, but can be done via XML. And the nil report is essentially a report saying that, hello, me, the FI XYZ uh, has no reportable accounts, FYI. Uh, so this report will not be forwarded to the authorities of any other country, uh, and it will not contain any information apart from that of the Swiss financial institution who is reporting. But then the FDA knows that here there were no reportable accounts. Then what we have seen uh, over the years, um, ourselves or with clients, maybe sometimes you realize that a file a report was not filed correctly for some reason. For example, the financial information was not correct and has been amended. So if for some reason you realize that a, a report has been done incorrectly, of course, I mean, most of the time uh, without you meaning to, then you need to uh, correct this report without delay. So once you realize that for some reason the first report was not correct, you file a correction. Uh, the same if for some reason you would realize that uh, a Swiss FI has not filed a report, although it was expected to, then again do this without delay. Uh, so you have it. Uh, it's important that if yeah, if you become aware that something is not correct, that you do take action uh, as soon as possible. Now, we will not um, go into further details on exactly what is being reported. I think you know about this, but we can also touch on this in the Q&A session if you have any questions. So now uh, I suggest we go into the juicy part of uh, the new CRS guidance, uh, the one from 2021. So the FDA um, posted uh, an updated guidance in early 2021. Uh, and as you know, probably if you have had a look at it, it's quite a long one. It's about, it's over 170 pages. Uh, and the FDA unfortunately did not really do us any favors by notifying about what is new. Uh, so we have been going through, going through paragraph for paragraph uh, and of particular interest to the fiduciary and trust industry, there are two things um, that, that we want to focus on today. Uh, it's first the account holder concept for FI trust and also a new look through approach. Uh, and then it's distributions here. Maybe it's not actually new, but at least or partly new, partly just clarifications. So we will go through these topics uh, and see uh, basically our what's our take on this. So in case of an FI trust, uh, the equity interest is now, according to the new guidance, uh, deemed to be held by any person who is the settler, the trustee, beneficiary or protector of whole of part uh, or the, of the trust and any other natural person who can effectively control the trust. And here, um, compared to the, to the previous version of the guidance, um, there are two quite important differences. First of all, the trustee is included. In the old guidance, the trustee was excluded. So basically, if you had a Swiss trust, Swiss trust meaning a trust with a Swiss trustee, the trustee was excluded of reporting. Now, in most cases, it wouldn't have made any difference because most of the time, yeah, like we say, it's a Swiss trustee and assuming the Swiss trustee does not have also, for example, yeah, participants abroad, it wouldn't have made any difference, uh, but we will come to that. And then protector, uh, previously protector was rather as an example uh, of a person, uh, of this, any other natural person who can effectively control. So then it said, for example, protector. Uh, and now in the new guidance, it says including trustee and protector. So they have strengthened this part. And what is completely new uh, is that if the settler, trustee, beneficiary, protector, or other person is an entity, this entity needs to be looked through 
uh, of course also any intermediary entities um, and then you would identify the controlling natural persons behind this entity and they would have to be considered equity interest holders. So this is, um, let's say, an implementation of the wording in the OECD implementation handbook that you apply this controlling person concept to account holders that are entities, but not only if they are FIs, but also if, um, sorry, not only if they are passive NFEs, but also, for example, if they are active or FI. So this is a quite important difference. To illustrate that, uh, we show you a table of the 2019 version and the 2021 version. And then you see that the settlor beneficiary, um, this remains the same. But when we come to the other uh, person who ultimately controls, then in the old version it was, for example, protector, uh, whereas now it says including trustee and protector. Um, otherwise, remains the same. And when it comes to protectors, uh, we do see a possible impact because many Swiss trusts do have, for example, um, a foreign protector. Let's say uh, it has a UK law firm as a corporate protector. Now, um, until now, assuming the pro corporate protector was an FI, that was it. No more look through, no reporting. But if you now would apply the, this controlling person look through concept, then you would actually have to identify the persons behind this corporate protector in the UK. And that's probably individuals resident in the UK. And these persons would have to be reported. Uh, so we think that this is most of all, let's say, an issue, if you can call it an issue for protectors, less uh, probably for trustees, because most of the Swiss trustee firms uh, also have Swiss controlling persons or person behind them. Um, and this may, for I mean, for fair reasons, maybe not all protectors want to be reported with the whole value of the trust. So we we can, let's say, expect that some changes uh, will be due uh, according to this. And it's important, of course, that these persons then um, are being identified and informed accordingly so that they know that as of next year, they would be reportable. If we go to the distributions, um, it's most of all clarifications, um, let's say, of completely um, very, let's say, clear rules that they have just added to the, to the guidance. Um, so a reportable person is a beneficiary uh, who has received uh, directly or indirectly a distribution from the trust. In case of uh, fixed interest beneficiaries that receive a mandatory distribution, they are always an account holder, whereas the discretionary um, the, um, beneficiary is only reportable in the period where he or she has received a distribution uh, and otherwise not. So this is nothing new. This is basically just clarifying what's already was the case. Then uh, the FDA has also um, added three examples to the guidance. Uh, and we will go through these examples because they're quite interesting. So the first two, I think they're not very controversial. Um, it's just explaining in case of A, uh, who is the beneficiary, uh, and the trust does not pay funds directly to A, but it pays the school fees of A's child. So this payment will uh, be considered a reportable distribution to A, uh, even though it was not made directly to her or him, but to the school. And I think this is quite clear that you couldn't circumvent CRS reporting by just saying that you pay the bills of the beneficiaries, but you don't consider this distribution. Because of course, at the end of the day, the, the beneficiary has benefited from this, whether it was paid directly to their account or to the school um, of the child. So this is quite clear. Um, the next example is very similar. Uh, instead of paying the school fees uh, directly to the school, uh, um, basically a transfer is made to the, to the lawyer of A and the lawyer of A will arrange for payments of the school fees. Again, this will be an indirect distribution to A, although A did not receive it uh, her or himself uh, and A will be reported with this amount. 
I think this is quite clear. So, so far, so good. This is just confirming what I hope or think that most people already knew. Then in the third example, uh, it gets more interesting because here they say that if A would receive a loan from the trust at below market interest uh, rates or maybe even without interest, uh, then the loan does not qualify as the distribution itself, um, which makes sense uh, because it does not encumber the assets of the trust. But the difference to a market interest rate will be considered a reportable distribution. So assume A, um, a has received a loan of 1 million and this loan is interest free uh, or this loan is 0.5% interest rate. Uh, then the trustee or the trust would have to basically establish that, okay, this is below market rate interest uh, and would have to calculate the, let's say, the difference and report this difference as a distribution. And here, of course, a lot of questions arise, like, what do you even consider to be a market rate interest? Uh, and according to which rules should you calculate this? Should you look at the Swiss reference rates? or the ones in the jurisdiction where the beneficiary lives. For example, in the UK, the, the concept of a deemed distribution is known. Um, and there are cases where the beneficiary, uh, or let's say the recipient of a loan, who is also um, beneficiary of the trust, do actually report this to the authorities and uh, pay taxes on it. So here, there would really be the question of, how do you get to this to the right amount? Uh, and I think this is uh, here, there's no guidance further on how to calculate this. So we think this is interesting to see how, how this will pan out in the future. And then of course, if you have these cases, it's just important that you have a look at them uh, so that you can, let's say, establish a way forward. Um, and here we cannot give any clear answers, but uh, we want to make you aware of this because it, um, of course, impacts the reporting obligation of an FI trust. Now, what is also clear um, and which they state here is that if a loan to a beneficiary is at some point written off, uh, then at this stage, the whole amount that has been written off um, constitutes a reportable distribution. This is also nothing new or controversial, um, and this is hopefully also quite clear to most uh, people in the industry, uh, because of course, uh, it would otherwise again be way too simple to circumvent, to just say that you grant a loan, uh, and then for some reason you waive it, uh, and then it's a nothing, it cannot be a nothing. So then it would have to be a reportable distribution when it has been waived or if it has been waived. So how to summarize these points um, is really to, uh, for each trust company uh, or trusts or trustee of a trust that is an FI, to make an assessment uh, of whether these changes have any impact uh, and if you have to take any action. So if you have not yet started this, we would suggest that you, you do so that you're ready uh, for, for the next year's reporting and making sure that everything is documented, everybody is on board. Uh, or of course, that uh, you can seek advice if you're not sure on how to deal with it. Good. So, I think we will move on to the next topic. Um, these are the inquiries from the Swiss Tax Administration. Um, we have seen now that some of our clients have started to receive inquiries from the tax administration in the last, let's say, 12 months or something. Uh, and this now refers to the 217 reports. So this means that the authorities um, yeah, are, let's say, working on the backlog and they are now looking at the 217 reports, maybe the 218 reports. So there will be a slight delay so that you will probably, if something is reported this year, maybe you won't hear anything about it until in a couple of years time. Probably this will speed up with time and as the authorities, let's say, gather more intelligence uh, and get a routine going. Um, but this shows that, um, that they're now really starting to look at it. 
We have some examples from practice, uh, from clients of ours or even colleagues of ours. Um, and we wanted to bring up a couple of type cases. Maybe you have also experienced this. So some requests or inquiries uh, come uh, to persons who, are, who have been reported in a professional capacity. So let's say the trustee or protector of a trust or the controlling person of an entity of the type senior managing official. So for example, the directors of the company. So basically a person that does not have an own ownership interest uh, in the FI, but has been subject to reporting. And here in these cases, the authorities might ask, okay, so Emily Mahler was reported here as a controlling person um, with uh, a million account balance and 100,000 in interest income, but we don't see this on her tax return. Why is this? And then Emily Mahler receives this letter uh, and Emily Mahler thinks, oh my God, what is this? Uh, and then basically you would have to, let's say, explain the circumstances. Why have you been reported? And why is this not in your tax return? So here it's rather about explaining. So the situation does not have to be very delicate. The person, as long as this person does not uh, have any, let's say, ownership interest or has not received these funds personally, do not have to put them in the tax return naturally. So here it's rather of an explaining mission. But it, of course, may still be cumbersome uh, to explain this. We have also seen some, let's say, more unfortunate reports, for example, banks who have reported the trustee of a trust as the account holder in own name. So instead of saying that the reported person is um, XYZ Limited as trustee of the ABC trust, then only the trustee in own name was reported. Uh, and then again, of course, the tax authorities ask, why is this bank account not disclosed in the tax return of the trustee, please provide information, right? And then again, you would have to go back and explain how this happened, maybe do some investigation um, to, to see what has happened and why, and how can you explain to the tax authorities how, how things should be or how things are, right? We have seen cases, for example, with charitable tax exempt foundations that have accounts abroad that have received um, queries. And then of course, if you're tax exempt, yeah, uh, you don't have to report much, but of course, maybe here the logic is rather to check, is this tax exempt status okay? Um, or do we have to scrutinize this more? So uh, the background of the request may have, of course, different reasons. Uh, and then, of course, um, I mean, we have to take it up. Uh, hopefully this is not a huge issue. But of course, uh, if somebody has undeclared accounts, let's say, for example, that I actually do have a bank account with a UK bank uh, where I have uh, 10 million and I did not disclose this to the Swiss tax authorities uh, and I did not pay taxes, well, then I have an issue. Um, so then, yeah, then we move less away from, or more away from the explanation part and really do I need to actually take action? Did I, did I miss to report something or, or tax something that should have been taxed, right? Um, and I think, this should not be a huge issue, but we mention it anyway. I think maybe Christian, uh, I don't know if you have some uh, real life experiences uh, from this, on this topic. Well, uh, hello everybody. Yes, I do. Um, I think um, I was kind of a, of a victim of that as well, as you can um, imagine, as a managing director of, of the Kendris Group, I got reported a couple of times. And uh, indeed, I'm living in a small uh, village um, in the canton of Argau, and my tax office, um, after the first reporting round, got quite excited because they thought, well, all financial problems of the municipality, if not even if of the canton of Argau, are now uh, solved. Um, so this this really happens. Uh, here, I think the important point is um, to react uh, immediately. So it doesn't go away. If you if you just uh, say to yourself, well, that that's utterly ridiculous. I'm not the owner of these assets and do nothing and throw the letter away. 
Uh, that's not the smartest reaction. We also had that with uh, some of our clients and it, it only gets worse. Uh, just take me wrong. It's not to blame the authorities. I mean, I am also them. It's, it's a weakness uh, of the system in that sense, you know. I mean, the authorities, at least in the first reporting round, had not much experience and they cannot know what's exactly behind of this structure. They just receive the information that uh, Christian Leek or Emily Mahler or somebody else has, uh, has been reported with a certain account balance and a certain income. They don't have the details of it. So it's clear that they uh, send an inquiry. And now we can, of course, go back uh, and say, why is this at all? I think uh, that, uh, that's uh, a mistake in the design of, of the CRS. That's uh, the reason probably is um, that in the OECD, more or less nobody understands what the trust is. At least um, I have not told, um, <clears throat> I've not spoken to any OECD official who could explain me why a protector is an account holder of a trust. But anyway, we cannot change it. Um, we have we have to deal with it. And the last point here at that point, uh, think of it, even if you're a Swiss trustee, this also happens in other countries. So if you do a reporting out of Switzerland because you're a Swiss trustee and have clients abroad and uh, you report protectors or, or, or other trustees or co-trustees or whatever uh, functions, then uh, think of it that also the the, the tax authorities in the contracting state, in the other state, in the resident state of, the, of your client will probably ask uh, similar questions. And so it's certainly good to take it up, um, to take it up with the client, because uh, sometimes in Switzerland, we can explain a lot to the tax authorities. In other countries, we all know it's, uh, it's every now and then much more difficult. Yeah. No, definitely. Thank you, Christian. Yeah, this is uh, an interesting point, of course, uh, because it's not only the, the Swiss tax authorities, of course, that will come with questions. This will happen or has happened in other countries as well. The approach of the authorities, like Christian says, can uh, can differ a little bit. We heard stories from, from the UK where the HMRC basically just issue a tax bill uh, based on the reports it amounts. So then I guess you're um, a little bit more under pressure to get everything <laughs> clarified um, and one weakness is really of the especially when we talk about account holders of a trust for example is that you don't see in which capacity somebody is an account holder so you are just an account holder period doesn't matter if you're the settler or the trustee or the protector um, so the report will not tell the tax authorities why somebody's reported so this is the typical case let's say of a protector that is being reported with the whole value of the trust's assets and then of course this protector uh, does not have this in their income tax return uh, and it's quite I mean I can understand why the tax authorities would ask questions then when we come to controlling persons it should be a little bit easier in the sense that uh, here you can at least Assuming the reporting FI has done everything correctly, uh, there are different categories of controlling persons. And if you're a controlling person uh, in your capacity as a senior managing official, rather than by way of ownership, then maybe the tax authorities should at least get a hint that this person is probably not actually the direct or indirect owner uh, of these assets, but merely a director. And maybe here they will learn uh, with time to, for example, filter a little bit better, or they have just said that we ask everywhere just to be sure. Uh, and then maybe the next time this report will come again, because of course it's not a one-off, but if somebody remains the controlling person, it will be reported again and again. Then maybe they say, okay, they explained it in year one. So for year two, we don't have to ask more questions. So, I think we have a question on that, Emily, yeah. exactly what you explained. Um, the question is in the chat. Does this mean yeah. the trustee will need to explain to every single year? Well, we don't have too many experience of too many years, but we hope not. Yeah, definitely. Uh, definitely. Because, yeah, uh, the idea would be that they do uh, understand that, okay, now this person has been reported as trustee or protector or controlling person, but has no own um, 
no ownership interest, let's say, and, and it would be very annoying if you have to answer the same question again. But yeah, I cannot <laughs> give you any promises, but no, hopefully they uh, so uh, then somebody asks here also trustees and protectors are only reportable if they have controlling powers right uh, yes and no basically a trustee and a protector falls in this category of any other person who can exercise control right uh, so ideally uh, the way that the rules are designed is that you should be able to make this assessment to say that does the protector actually really have sufficient control, let's say, to be considered an account holder? But we see a trend where these capacities are being treated as account holders by definition. So this is what you will see in the um, what you we discussed on the on the new guidance that now they are basically explicitly listed as persons who will always be considered uh, account holders. I personally think that this is a little bit unfortunate, especially in the case of protectors. Um, but we, yeah, we, we rather see that this is direction, the direction it will go uh, in more and more jurisdictions. So I hope I, I could answer that question. Good. Uh, and we can, we can surely come back to this, to this topic in the Q&A as well. Uh, if we go back to the yeah to the inquiries so to just kind of wrap up here, uh, questions we think that are relevant to ask. Um, if you receive an inquiry, is, yes, what is the purpose of this inquiry? Can I try to figure out or understand what was the thinking of the tax authorities when they did write me this question? Um, how can I best reply to this inquiry? To, to understand what do they want to know uh, or which documentation do they need in order to uh, to basically accept my explanation. Um, and then, of course, if something is actually wrong, for example, if we talk about undeclared accounts, then is any remedial action required? Because then it's not only about answering the letter, but actually making sure that, that you get your affairs straight. But um, again, I don't think that this should be a big issue. And like Christian says, just ignoring the inquiries uh, is not a good tactic. We've seen that with one of the cases where even in Switzerland, where they basically um, issued a new tax bill because they said, well, we, until we uh, receive any documentation or explanation um, explaining otherwise, we will consider you basically as, as the beneficial owner uh, of this account uh, abroad uh, and we will issue an updated tax bill. So this can be expensive. So yes, definitely try to, uh, or please react to these inquiries. And of course, if you feel like you're not equipped to answer the question directly, seek counsel to make sure that everything is covered. But this is really, um, do not throw the letter away. Okay. Great, then. I think we, oh, today we have a lot of time, but that's good. Maybe you can have, even have an early lunch break. So I will move on to the CRS audit topic. Uh, and again, if any questions uh, so from the presentation so far arise, take note of them or send them in the chat and then we take it in the Q and A's. So you probably heard about the CRS audits uh, that are coming or have started even. Um, the FTA started auditing banks, most of all. Uh, they did um, a round of pilot audits or let's say test audits of one big bank, uh, one big, let's say, yeah, one big bank, one private bank and one trust company. And that trust company was Kendris, and we will uh, tell you a little bit more about our experience. Um, but first, as a background to the CRS audits. So the FDA um, conducts audits basically to ensure that the, um, the CRS or the automatic exchange of information is being properly Im implemented. So they will audit financial institutions uh, or for example, fiduciary companies with many fi uh, financial institutions and their client base to see how have they implemented this, um, how do they deal with due diligence, reporting, is everything correct and complete, are there any errors, etc. And this is of course a part of 
of the FDA, ensuring that it's been properly implemented throughout the industry, which makes sense. So just the legal basis on which they do conduct these audits, um, you find in the AEO Act or the AIAG uh, in German, uh, in French, um, I'm not sure, I think it's the LA. AR uh, basically gives the FDA the right to inspect books, records, um, other documents to obtain information in writing and verbally. So this is the basis on which they can even conduct an audit. And they do have the right to do this. So if they come and say, we would like to audit you, there's not much you can do. You will be audited. Uh, under the Article 25 of the AEO Act, um, somebody who is subject to an audit um, must provide the FDA with all the facts relevant. So basically, if they re request information, you will be obliged to, obliged to give this information. And this is, again, I mean, something that you have probably many of you have experienced, for example, if you're members of an SRO or something like that, that you have had AML audits. Um, so the, the idea of an audit, you already know it. So of course, if the FDA basically asks you uh, to provide provide information or documentation, you will have to do it. Then hopefully they will not come with impossible requests, uh, for example, to, to prove something, prove a negative or something like that. But yeah, so uh, here again, if you receive a request, not only in connection to an audit, but if you basically receive a request from the FTA to provide something, you will have to give it. Then of course, um, they have also, they are acting under confidentiality rules. So this means that they may, what they find out in an audit or otherwise uh, from an FI, they may not may not share it with other authorities or private individuals, of course. Um, I mean, they cannot talk about it at the dinner table at home. Uh, and the information may only be used for the implementation of the CRS. Uh, so this means that if if the FTA finds out something that is relevant for another topic, then basically they, they cannot make use of it. So in that sense, it's strictly AEOI. Um, and these points are just important to, to have as a background. Now we can expect, we were, Kenders was uh, subject to this test audit back in December 19. So of course, things might have changed after that. Probably the FDA has learned a lot also over the, the, the past 18 months. Um, but just a little bit so you get an idea about like what's the method and what's the scope of an audit if you would be subject to one. So um, the FDA will have people on site that get unrestricted and unmonitored assets to relevant documentation, IT applications, etc. Um, they will review this documentation, procedures we have in place, internal guidances, training programs for employees, etc. They will assess the complete lists and corrections of the entity classifications, due diligence documentation, what was reported, how and why. Have a look at, for example, self-certifications, financial statements, etc., to understand what has been reported. Or, for example, if a nil return was filed, why was this? Uh, how have you documented that there were no reportable account holders, etc.? Um, they do conduct interviews and expect that key people uh, will be available during the audit. Uh, so it's not only about what you have documented, of course, but how the, the key people that actually carry out this work, uh, do they have a sound understanding of what they're doing? Can they explain, uh, answer questions or explain discrepancies? This is an important one. Oh, I see. Some more questions. Let me have a look at that. Uh, and as always in an audit, I think should be the focus as most of all to, to see do we find any or do the FTA, FTA find any, let's say, systematic failures? So of course, in an audit, in an unfortunate case, they might realize that, okay, in this particular case, what trust ABC, something was not done correctly. The due diligence is not completely uh, 100% or, or something was not reported correctly. This is, of course, I mean, if something like that is found out, then it would most likely have to be, be amended. But most important in an audit is to look at, 
uh, how has this whole infrastructure been set up for the FI? Uh, which kind of policies and procedures are in place to ensure, for example, that you can effectively track uh, change in circumstances or how you onboard new clients? Uh, how you uh, basically record so you have an audit trail to show not only that you report the, the correct amounts, but how did you get to these amounts, etc. So, so the focus is much on a on a systematic level, uh, which which is also, let's say, quite reasonable. Uh, good. And then I think one big change for the FTA after having audited banks, where you have, let's say, the opposite situation. You have one FI with thousands of account holders. And then you come to the trust industry or the fiduciary industry, and then you rather have one company, um, like a Kendris or, or, or something similar, uh, with many FIs, each FI having only a couple of account holders, maybe. So the whole, you have to switch the perspective completely. Um, and I think that the FTA has learned a lot during the, the past years, but this is really important to kind of sense the, the, the difference between a bank type of FI and, for example, a trust type of FI. Uh, and yeah, now I already gave that away, but yeah, so I did mention to you, uh, we were a subject to this pilot audit um, and we did pass it with flying colors, I dare to say. So no deviations or errors, no suggestions of changes. So that was good. It was, a, it was an interesting experience, a good health check. And our takeaway is really, I put it here in writing, in fact, documentation, documentation, documentation. It's not only about doing the right thing, but being able to demonstrate that you have been doing the right thing, that you have everything documented so that it's clear. Um, why is this person reportable? Why is this person not reported? Uh, why, how did I come to exactly this amount? Um, how do I train my staff, um, et cetera, et cetera. So everything needs to be documented uh, in, in guidances, internal um, guidances, et cetera. And of course, lived by as well. So it's not only about having a fancy compliance program, but also being able to demonstrate that you're actually acting according to this program. Uh, so this is really the, the key takeaway uh, for us. I will link, you will see this also when when you receive the, um, the PDF copy of this presentation. I have linked to a blog post where we wrote some more about this topic. Uh, and then I think we we are all quite curious to see how it will then you know, proceed with the CRS audits moving forward. Uh, I know that the FDA had a webinar, I think in October, 2020, where they um, talked a little bit about um, Pascal Michel, talked about, let's say, the experiences they have made during the audits and explained the whole idea behind the audits, findings they have made, etc. Uh, and then it would also, they basically said that uh, the pace of the upcoming CRS audits will also depend a little bit on the situation. So I guess that was probably partly Corona, um, let's say uh, considering Corona. So at this stage, I don't know how, how many audits they have conducted or how they have changed their methods, but uh, it's just good to be aware that CRS audits may come your way and then you want to be, you want to be prepared. Good. Now, Christian, I think we will think a little bit about where do we stand now? Where do we go from here? Uh, I can just start off by, um, uh, by saying this, that the Global Forum, the OECD Global Forum, uh, has performed peer reviews. Uh, the last one for Switzerland, the second one, uh, was conducted in 2020, and Switzerland has been labeled as largely compliant, um, which is, of course, not a bad uh, rating. But we do expect that they are trying to cover gaps. This is well, why we have seen updates to the legislation, to the guidance, to basically, you know, take one step up uh, and become even more, even more compliant. So I think that we will see this work continuing. Uh, and Christian, do you have any other interesting insights? 
Uh, well, no, <laughs> not really insights, but you see, of course, with the with the implementation of MDR, um, the the OECD uh, was aware of some loopholes and then implemented the MDR, which is the DAC six um, issue in the in the EU, and um, uh, it was uh, quite slow the development on on that side. But uh, now, after the pandemic situation uh, comes to an end or slows down, I think we will see, or at least we wouldn't be surprised if the MDR will be uh, somewhere introduced in, in other financial centers as well. Uh, you know, MDR, at least these famous hallmarks D uh, of tax six, um, but MDR in its pure sense, it's about CRS avoidance. So. I think that's one uh, um, important development we will see to close the loopholes um, to, to tackle avoidance. The second thing uh, which, uh, which we see now every now and then, uh, they add more countries. Uh, I mean, it was from the outset, it was be meant as a global uh, thing and global standard and uh, you know, at the beginning, uh, malicious tongues said, well, that's uh, the first world exchanging information they anyway know of each other. But now we see that also uh, more African countries, more Central Asian countries um, and become part of the CRS. And then on, on the wider horizon, one can ask, what's the, what's the future of CRS, uh, including the United States? Big question mark, you know, uh, the Corporate Transparency Act in the United States is about to kick off, uh, will be probably introduced uh, 2023, uh, or <clears throat> and then uh, uh, once this uh, will be in place, also, the United States will have uh, fulfilled the condition precedent to collect bio information also. Um, and uh, I think maybe in, in, in uh, the far future, we will even see that one of the systems will be abolished. But uh, if I had to bet, I would say uh, I'll be retired by then. But uh, Emily, probably not yet. Uh, Unfortunately <laughs> not. No. <laughs> <laughs> Still have a couple of decades. To, to, you, you are aware of these of these developments, not linked uh, directly to CRS uh, with um, with uh, uh, these uh, pillar one and pillar two, and, and including the the uh, these digital firms taxation, the minimum taxation. Um, this has nothing directly to do with CRS, but will also, of course, impact and the information exchange and, and uh, on, on that level, if, uh, if firms uh, become resident or tax resident in countries, they, they are not yet. So this is maybe the, the major development. Definitely. Yeah. And then we have heard some rumors that uh, there are consultations on OECD level on basically updating the, the common reporting standard. Um, so here we might also see changes, um, basically a CRS 2.0, uh, where again, maybe some gaps are being closed or further explanations are being given. Um, which may also, these kind of things do not happen very quickly, but maybe in the next couple of years or something like that, we might experience changes here. So we think that, uh, uh, yeah, there there will be some, some updates, definitely. And like Christian correctly pointed out, MDR or CRS avoidance is becoming a topic in more and more countries. Uh, so of course, first you have to have CRS in place, but then you also need to make sure that people do not um, avoid it. Uh, so this is something that we would probably expect to see in Switzerland at some stage. Uh, so I think these are yeah, we need to, we're not finished yet. Uh, and hopefully, I mean, in let's say if we get an amended or updated version of the common reporting standard, probably there would also, ideally there would be some fine tuning, for example, uh, but this is maybe just wishful thinking from my side. It would be excellent if, for example, the account holder concept could be a little bit more refined so that you could show which type of account holder somebody is, for example, protector, trustee, etc. This will, would make the um, information more sensible to the tax authorities uh, and probably avoid some questions. But yeah, this, this might definitely be, be wishful thinking.
So I think we just need to keep our eyes open uh, and make sure that we track these the, the upcoming updates uh, and make sure to, every time there's something new, reassess your situation. Do you have to take action? Does it impact you at all, et cetera? And then always, always stay on the ball. Good. Excellent. And I think, uh, I see that I, uh, we received a couple of questions in the chat. We will, um, we will reply to those. So I suggest we move on to the Q&A session. Now we have more than enough time uh, for the Q&A session. I will not keep you until 12 o'clock if not necessary, of course, but just please feel free to, to ask your questions. Um, so we did get a couple of questions in the chat. I will start with them. Um, somebody did ask, does the new guidance confirm if the classifications under CRS differ to the classifications under FATCA? And to my knowledge, there's no, let's say, written confirmation that this is the case. But there are, of course, um, instances where an entity has a different classification under FATCA than under CRS. This is logical in the sense that you have two different set of rules. Um, so if you classify um, an entity for FATCA purposes under the applicable IGA or under the Treasury regulations, the definitions are, of course, very similar to those of CRS, but there are some differences. So technically you could have, for example, an entity that is an FFI for FATCA purposes, but PNFE for CRS purposes. And then probably you would have to answer some questions when you open the bank account and uh, certify the status, but this should not be basically between, um, among people who, who know they, their way around FATCA and CRS, this should not be an issue. I mean, it should be possible to explain. But probably 95% of the cases, an entity will be an FFI for FATCA purposes and an FI for CRS purposes. I hope I answered this question. Otherwise, please reach out. Then we got the question. So if we have reporting of the trustees, so now we come to the look through, the look tr through approach uh, in case of trustees or protectors. So if we have a corporate trustee, uh, do you have to report the, the owners, um, the shareholders of this corporate trustee or the directors? And this is typical lawyer answer. You can say it depends. So basically, when you look through this corporate trustee, we can take one of our corporate trustees as an example uh, in the Kendris group. So basically, we have a Swiss corporate trustee that is owned by Kendris. Kendris is owned by a large number of persons, so nobody holds closely to, to 25%. So then you do not look at the shareholders, but rather at the managing officials, for example, the directors. So this will really depend. Uh, you apply the controlling person rules just as normal, I would say. Uh, and then first you look at if there's anybody who could be a controlling person um, due to ownership directly or indirectly, or if not, any other controlled by other means or if not you go at the senior managing officials mm. uh, what was you and if you look at the shareholders uh yeah basically well this same actually but if you look at the shareholders you would have to look through all of the intermediary steps so that there could of course be a chain of entities and you really need to look at the uh, for the for the warm bodies at the end of the chain uh then we have a question on crs report submission so So when submitting a manual CRS report for trust, uh, currently the AEA portal requires one report per individual. On each report, you supply name, address, TIN, date of birth, et cetera, account balance. Um, uh, when reporting the trustee slash protector, do we also provide the financial figures? Um, yes, so if you would have a Swiss FI trust, here it doesn't really matter if it's a manual or an XML report, uh, if I understand the question correctly. So basically, if you say that, for example, 
the protector is reportable, then the protector is reported with the account balance uh, of the trust or, or if the trustee would be reported. Um, then as long as this person did not receive anything, um, this is not reported. But yeah, so it's not only named, you would also have to have an account balance and that account balance will basically be the, the value of the trust asset. Mm -hmm. Then, do we have more? Uh, so, somebody has, uh, mentions that um, Swiss banks do not allow different status under FATCA and CRS on their forms. So I think that if you have a case where uh, you have a differing CRS and FATCA classification, maybe you would have to take this up with the relationship manager or they would even have to go to their compliance department because we do see a trend of uh, a lot of the banks trying to merge as much as uh, the forms so that they don't have to collect different forms. Um, so then it's quite common that they use these combined forms uh, where you just, for example, certified to be an FFI, FI for both, uh, under both regimes done, uh, or PNFE or ANFE. Uh, and if you really have a case where you say this, I cannot fill this combined form out because uh, it doesn't allow for me to, to um, confirm two different statuses, then of course, probably the bank would have, let's say a CRS form and a W8 pen E or something to fill out. So I think that this, this should be manageable if the bank knows what they're doing. Um, what do we have here? Uh, one question uh, in relation to non-professional trustees um, acting for their close relatives um, would have to complete CRS on, uh, reporting on an annual basis. Are there separate rules applying? I mean, no, I would say not. Of course, I mean, you would have to look at the, the CRS rules. So if you have a non-professional trustee acting as a trustee for uh, for the trust of a close relative, you would have to have a look at, you know, the, the classification. If this is an individual, for example, it is, it is not itself a reporting FI, so the trust could not be a TDT based on, on that. So maybe the trust would be passive NFE, for example, because it cannot fulfill the, the professionally managed test. But basically, I mean, the, the rules are, are <laughs> the, the rules are the rules. So I think that in such a case, probably have a look at the classification of the trust to see what the obligations will be for the trust or for the trustee, uh, and that will apply. Uh, you may definitely ask questions orally, somebody asked, so please unmute yourself if you want to ask a question uh, orally, and then uh, we can also we can address them directly. So... Uh, then we have another question regarding the trust. So if the settler of a trust is a married couple, when submitting the report on the settlers, do you split the reported financial figures in half? Uh, the question is no. Um, or the, the answer is no. So if you have two settlers of a trust, uh, they will be attributed with the full value of the trust. So you cannot really split it. Uh, and the same actually goes for, for example, the protector and the trustee. So let's say you have... 10 million total assets in the trust, then settler number one will be reported with 10 million and settler number two will be reported with the same amount and the trustee might be reported with the same amount according to the new rules, of course, um, or the, the protector uh, could be reported with the same. So unfortunately, you, you cannot split. Uh, and let's see if we... Try. So please, please unmute yourself and ask questions if you would like to. Then we have another question here. Do you use any due diligence software at Kendris for risk assessment, reporting, secure customer boarding, etc.? So uh, we do have uh, different uh, softwares or software to, because of course we cannot do all of the work manually. We have two, two big large volumes to do everything yeah. manually. Too big, large volume. So, I think now we have an echo. Sorry about that. I Hello, would... can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, hi, Emily. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Christian, and thank you, Kendris, for all this. 
really much appreciated. I just have just two small questions and I'm going to go straight to the point. Um, we have here, um, we've got some, uh, we're a professional trustee. We've got some advice from uh, a law firm here in Geneva. And uh, basically, um, we have a trust with an underlying company. Bank account is at the level of the underlying company. And that, uh, and the lawyer uh, advised that the whole structure basically is to be considered as FI. Uh, as such that if we have a trust as FI and an underlying company as passive NFE, there might be some double reporting issues and mm -hmm. we'd like to avoid double reporting issues. Yep. So the, the, the lawyer advised that not only the trustee on the top is an FI, underlying company is FI as well. Mm -hmm. Now, my question is, if I have the underlying company as an FI, I'm not, and let's say the FI is a BVI, I'm not really going to do a, a BVI report as well as doing the trustee report or the Swiss trustee with the uh, with the SCA website. Yeah. So what is your take on that? Does it make sense to classify the whole structure as FI? Uh, I mean, uh, I can start with answering the question like this. Uh, if you would assume that you have the, the, the top FI, uh, the trust as an FI, the underlying BVI company is an FI, then it is correct that the, um, uh, the underlying BVI it doesn't have to report its equity interest holder, the trust, because it's also an FI. So assuming there are no other account holders, then effectively the, the underlying company will only file a nil return in the BVI. And then the trustee of the trust will file a report in Switzerland. And then you don't have this kind of double reporting. Because of course, if you do have a PNFE under with a bank account, then the bank uh, will report um, on the bank account, uh, look through, the structure, of course, to basically identify the controlling persons of the underlying. So you have potentially settler, trustee, protector, beneficiary subject to reporting. And then you have, like you say, basically a double reporting because the trust in Switzerland will also report to the authorities. So you have an overlap. So in that sense, it of course might be neater or more understandable for the authorities if you only have reporting at the, the, the top level uh, and not into different jurisdictions with slightly different but still overlapping information. So in that sense, these pure FI structures can, let's say, make, make a more make a better picture. Then, of course, at the end of the day, it comes down to whether the underlying company actually does qualify for an FI status. Right? So this, this would be the, the crucial question here. Uh, I think from my side, uh, <clears throat> uh, yes, I share Emily's view. It makes a lot of sense. Because you have to you have to see that that if you have a double reporting, the reporting is not about the same figures. You know, I mean, if you have a, a chain of FIs like you describe it with trust, underlying company, and FI, then um, only let's say if there are no other um, uh, account, then you only report out of the trust. And then you report the account balance of the trust. And now if the client is, for instance, tax resident in a country where trust is, is, um, is, is uh, not known or not recognized, it, it's, it's better to explain or it's easier to explain such a reporting than if you have, in addition to that trust reporting, you anyway have, because the trust will, as an FI, do the reporting, you, in addition, have a reporting from a bank on a bank account income and a bank account uh, account balance of something which is for sure for sure not in the tax declaration and will confuse uh, the tax authorities even more and so it will it will take you probably an awful lot of time if you have bad luck to explain that because what can the bank report the bank can only report what the bank knows, and this is the bank account. And if you have a trust with more assets, then it's 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 a confusing reporting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I mean that that would definitely yeah. cause a that would definitely cause a, the headache. So, base, basically, if I do the reporting on the trust level, um, and I'll do a nil report on the BVI one, and let's say there's just a bank account via the underlying company held within the trust structure. When I do the report on the trust level, we do agree that when I want to uh, report the account balance on trust level, I will actually report the literally the account balance of the bank account of the underlying company, right? Mm 
Yeah, if this is the only asset, then then indirectly you have reported the account balance of the bank yeah. account. It's just not made from the bank uh, and in a little bit of a different manner because the bank would report the account balance of the account and dividends received, etc. So the the it would look different, but yes, essentially you're reporting the bank account, right? And any other assets. Um, so it's not about avoidance or anything like that. The amount will still be reported. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I've seen on some bank accounts when I open the account, you know, we, that is, oh, sorry. Yeah, oh, of course, please, no, please go ahead. bank account forms uh, when I open the account for the underlying company, obviously, and that is in terms of how you classify the entity. But I've seen sometimes when you open a bank account for an entity, I have the option to select TDT, so Trusty Documented Trust, even though it's a company, mm -hmm. to classify that underlying company. Would that make sense in terms of, well, we're just doing what it says, the trustee is actually responsible as shareholder responsible for the reporting? Could I put TDT? as a classification for an underlying company as far as the bank forms are concerned? I would say no. Um, I, I mean, only a trust, a trust could be a TDT, a trustee documented trust. So the underlying company would have to be classified yeah. as an entity yeah. in its own capacity. Um, so I think that if this is an option, maybe it's just they, they provided a form that would be applicable both to, to corporations and trusts or something like that. So I, I would expect that the bank protests if you try to say that a, a, a BVI company is a TDT. Okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, and and I, I'm not going to okay. monopolize everything, but my 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 second question was basically, and that was in relation to, um, you know, uh, register new Swiss reportable FIs with the Swiss tax authorities mm -hmm. as soon as they become uh, reportable FIs, and also the register when they're when it's no longer the case in writing. Now I've I have a case in that my that was in my predecessor, basically a trust was not registered last year. Uh, in time, so which actually put me in the position now, whereas on 30th of June, I was not able to do a reporting because on the Swiss website on my list of TDTs, I did not see that entity. So mm -hmm. I registered it before the 30th of June, but mm -hmm. I'm, so I'm sure you know when you do a registration, um, you don't even get a confirmation of registration. Uh, it just takes you back to the home page. So um, I'm in a situation now where I would want it to, 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 to report that trust mm -hmm. because it's reportable, but cannot do it yet. Yeah. And the deadline has passed. What, what, what is your take on that? So, uh, basically, I mean, the, these sort of situations may occur. Uh, and first of all, yes, uh, it is a little bit unfortunate when you do right. register new yeah, entities. And first of all, yes, uh, it is a little bit uh, sorry, there's a, an echo. I hear myself as well. Um, so, Basically, I will mute you just to to uh, avoid the echo. Sorry about that. Uh, so when you do register a new entity, like you say, you basically do not receive a confirmation. So you don't even know where this registration is. And it will take some time before you get the registration code so you can activate. Um, if this takes more than, let's say, a week or two, we usually follow up with the authorities to ask them, did you receive the registration request for the ABC Trust? If so, uh, you know, <laughs> will, will we receive a code within shortly just to follow up that it has really gone through because you cannot really see this. Uh, so that's more on, on the technical part that um, please follow up on this if you did not yet receive the code. Um, and then second of all, yes, I mean, you can only... Uh, Given the circumstances, you will, um, as soon as you get access to the portal, file the report. Uh, so basically, you will have two delays, right? You will have uh, the delay that you should have uh, registered or your predecessor, somebody should have registered the trust before year end 2020. Uh, and the report should have been filed by the 30th of June. And both these deadlines are passed. And now how the authorities look at this. I cannot tell you if they, for example, would decide to impose a penalty fee or if they say, well, the delay was not that big, we can live with it. I cannot tell. But I mean, here, I think that the important thing is to act as quickly as possible. So if something like this occurs, that you really try to take action. Um, and then best case scenario, there are no implications. Worst case scenario, the, the tax authorities will issue a penalty fee. And then you can always, of course, discuss responsibilities. Let's say who's paying the bill. Uh, I think that's 
that's what we can say in this one. Uh, I hope this hope this makes sense, and I hope you will get it sorted. Very much, Emily. Thanks a lot. No, thank you. Thank very you much very much. For your questions. Good, and then yeah, eleven fifty four. So I thought I will uh, let you go earlier, but we still actually have some questions. I will have a look at the chat and see if I can re reply to a couple of the questions at least. Uh, and otherwise, please feel free to contact me or Christian directly also after the webinar if you have any additional questions. So let's see, what do we have here? Um, is the settler always reported with a bank account, um, uh, with the account balance uh, of a discretionary trust? Then yes, the settler is always uh, in Switzerland reported with the full account balance. There are other rules in other countries, for example, in Liechtenstein, to name an example, where you can differentiate between controlling and non-controlling settlers. But here, a settler is subject to reporting with a full account balance, um, even if legally, I mean, let's say it's an irrevocable discretionary trust, the settler cannot even receive benefits. He will never see this money again, but he, he will anyway be reported with the full, with the full amount. And then we have... Let's see. I think uh, actually we will have to skip skip a couple of last questions. I'm very sorry about this. We do, do get a lot of questions about the, the trusts. Um, and here we're happy for you to reach out to us, as I said, that, um, after the webinar. We're happy to, to, to assist you if we can do this in any way. Uh, somebody has asked if we provide advice and assistance with CRS issues to other trustees and trust companies. And um, the answer is yes, we do. Uh, we do provide advisory services, reporting services, um, I don't want to make too much marketing, but I, I can mention it since the question came up. Uh, because anyway, we had to build up the whole infrastructure for our own clients uh, and, and have the know-how in-house. And then we said, why not share it with others as well? Uh, and I think this might be the end of the Q&A session, uh, but we're really thrilled to see that we had so many per yeah, participants and so many questions. Uh, this really shows that uh, it's, a, it's an interesting and relevant topic, so we will also bear this in mind when we are planning future events to maybe do a catch-up after the summer holidays. Uh, and yeah, this is, we're really, really happy that we have so many participants. Uh, a couple of last slides. This might be more useful for you um, when you receive the presentation. So basically, you have the contact details to Christian and myself uh, with our phone number, email address, links to our LinkedIn's. We're happy for you to connect with us on LinkedIn so you see if we share any content or blog posts, webinars, etc. So you stay in the loop and see uh, what's going on. Maybe not only in the CRS world, but can this work in general? Uh, I also want to promote um, our um, new website. So click around a little bit on our new website. There's a link here. Uh, we have a news and insights um, chapter where we have, let's say, blog posts, news, events, etc. We also have several newsletters, for example, a regulatory newsletter on the topic of CRS and other topics, but also on VAT, uh, other markets, etc. So, I mean, please click around on our webpage, our blog, subscribe to our newsletters uh, to stay in the loop. Uh, and then I think we will now go on a well-deserved summer break, but we will really try to, to continue with these webinars or maybe with physical seminars if um when the situation looks a little bit better uh, and hope of course to see all of you again then next time around so with this uh, a big thank you uh from christian and myself and old firm uh enjoy your lunch break and then i hope to hear from you soon again thank you very much goodbye thank you bye bye thank you thank you